Well, thank you very much. So today I will talk about um, deep feed forward neural networks, particularly how we quantify data needs uh, for deep feed forward neural network analysis. And the application will be uh, seismic reservoir characterization. Um, my grandfather, who was a mathematician and statistician by background, uh, used to speak in quotes. And this is one of the quotes that he referred to frequently. Having enough data, statistically, one can predict anything. And as one of our first speakers, uh, Andreas, pointed out, your input and your output need to be correlated somehow, otherwise there is no point of applying uh, machine learning. So um, in the, one of the books about Wall Street, um, the books uh, Gents with No Sense, Ron Delegger mentions that 99% of statistics tells only 49% uh, uh, of a story. So keep that in mind. That's why machine learning doesn't apply to sports, as the university professor pointed out. It doesn't apply to politics, or frequently misused in politics. And for the same reason, it probably in certain cases doesn't apply to geophysics. Uh, there is a bit of a difference in statistical learning and machine learning. In statistical learning, uh, of course, there is a lot of overlap as well. But in statistical learning, we usually establish an a priori model. We usually establish a hypothesis of some sort, and then after the fact, we are trying to prove that the hypothesis is right. In machine learning, specifically in supervised learning, when we are training on a subset of data, we don't have an a priori assumption. Um, so how do we determine the accuracy of these predictions? First of all, the accuracy of the predictions is determined on the quality of your data. Um, however, uh, we need to have some degree of variance in the sampling of our data. And many of the speakers pointed out that if I am narrowing, uh, Lucy pointed out, if I'm narrowing my data too much, then I am biasing my solution to my training data. That's why I need to have a degree of variance uh, and have different demographics, uh, different geological aspects uh, compounding towards training data. And of course, size of data sampling, how much data is enough, whether it will be three wells or whether it will be 200 wells. So this is what I will be covering now in my presentation, and there is some overlap with previous talks. Uh, Essentially, I will talk about uh, neural networks and how can I apply these neural networks for seismic reservoir characterization. But in previous talks, uh, our speakers mainly talked about classification problems, right? About facies recognition problems, whether they were applied to well logs or to seismic data. In this case, I am trying to predict the direct properties, the direct volumes, let's say porosity, V-shell, and water saturation volumes. So it's a mapping problem, not a classification problem. Uh, for the purposes of prediction, I will use deep feed forward neural network. I will talk about validation and, and parametrization of uh, this neural network and how specifically it affects uh, the data requirements. And uh, I will also cover the aspect of adding synthetic data. So per offset uh, mentioned about generating um, pseudo wells using rock physics. So that will be one of the workflows that I will talk about. Um, this technology is available in CGG software Emerge. Uh, it's not a new technology. It has been on the market since late 1990s. Uh, what's new in uh, Emerge, uh, the name of the software, is uh, that we added deep feed forward neural network. So my input data uh, will be well logs. So these are the well properties that I'm trying to predict. Let's say I want to predict the porosity volume, then I'm training on uh, porosity well logs. I will also use seismic data as my input and unlimited number of attributes. And the typical workflow uh, would be, traditionally, that would be to use multilinear regression, 
but multilinear regressions are not cool anymore, so we are moving on away from multilinear regression and traditional validation analysis, and we are going to neural networks uh, directly. And there are different types of neural networks. Emerge um, had a probabilistic neural network, uh, radial basis function, multilayer feedforward neural networks. Uh, what we are finding now is that deep feedforward neural networks gives really promising results. And the result will be the actually predicted volume of the log property. So in this case, it's a porosity volume. So again, neural networks have been around um, for a number of years. Uh, yet in geophysics, we were a little bit reluctant to use neural networks, but particularly for property predictions. And that's mainly because of the lack of good well control. So these are the neural networks that I already mentioned. Um, I have the mouse here. Uh, we have probabilistic neural network and multilayer feedforward neural network. And the new addition that's available right now is the deep feedforward neural network. What we are finding is that neural networks can produce uh, traditionally um, or in our porosity cases, better results than a multilinear regression. I was a bit surprised that your 4D study uh, was not successful on neural networks, but perhaps it depends upon um, what algorithms you used. Uh, traditionally, they give better results because of that nonlinear solution that they find the nonlinear relationship between well data and seismic data, or well data and the attributes. Uh, here's one of the examples of uh, multilinear regression on the left and probabilistic neural networks that was applied on the right. Um, this is done on the Blackfoot data set from Canada, and I am predicting the uh, high porosity channel here. And the results are slightly better with uh, probabilistic neural network. And if I compare it to the geological setting, uh, you see that uh, probabilistic neural network was able to identify that upper valley channel and the lower, lower valley channel. Uh, so what's happening uh, in case um, with respect to feed-forward neural network? So feed-forward neural network is a supervised neural network. Uh, the learning algorithm uh, trains uh, on some labeled training data set, set, so we do need to have well data to train on, and then we generalize to uh, um, the unseen situation. So many people covered it already. The resulting model is statistical. Um, a multi-layer neural network is considered to be deep if we have more than one, uh, more than two layers. If you have zero layers, that's your traditional multilinear regression, and that's what we actually can prove scientifically. If I take a uh, deep feed forward neural network, set the uh, number of hidden layers to zero, the results will be the same as traditional multilinear regression. Um, if I have one layer, this is your multi feed forward uh, neural network. Uh, what's interesting, and that's also proven with the universal. Uh, approximation theory is that if I have eight to ten layers, then I can simulate uh, uh, any nonlinear function. So the idea is to increase as uh, the depth of the neural network so I can um, train the data very, very accurately. But that depends upon the amount of the well control uh, available. The amount of the well control usually limits the training data set to a certain number of points. And that's why there was some reluctance, as I mentioned, to, to adopt the deep feed forward uh, neural networks for reservoir geophysics. Uh, so you've seen this diagram a number of times. So DFNN, deep feed forward neural network, is an extension of multi layer feed forward neural network, except we are extending the number of hidden layers. And if we can combine many networks in the series, we can, crea can create a multi-layer neural network. And extra layers allow us uh, to model transforms uh, that are higher order polynomials. So they can approximate your training data more accurately. Uh, if I compare traditional 
multilinear regression with probabilistic neural network and DFNN. For that porosity prediction example, um, I can see that, um, so on the very uh, right hand side, uh, DFNN is, ab is able to extrapolate away from the, uh, from the well location, the prediction a little bit better. Um, PNN and multilinear regression um, uh, give good results at the well locations. However, they're not go good at uh, predicting outside of the well data. So how do you know uh, when to stop training and when to uh, when you, how many parameters to add. So training the deep feed forward neural network is the process of determining the optimal set of weights. The weights are solved, uh, as was mentioned before, using a large nonlinear inverse problem. Um, to ensure that the network is not overtrained, we usually have a separate uh, validation data set. Uh, because deep feed forward uh, neural networks are at risk of overtraining. So if I cross plot the number of parameters versus the error, let's say uh, the more parameters I add, the smaller my training error gets. And then what will happen with my, my validation, my validation will reach a minimum of some sort and then the validation error will go up, indicating that I'm overtraining. So my goal is to add more data here and if I add more data, will I see a different dip on the validation curve? So I'm hoping that if I add more data, whether it's synthetic data or real data, that the validation curve will uh, drop out at the low, with the lower error. Uh, so how much training data is needed? Uh, to quantify the data requirements, uh, first of all, we need to quantify what uh, measures the success of good training. Um, we need to have good validation procedure, and in this case, I use the so-called percentage-based validation. Uh, a lot of speakers use the jackknife approach, which is a blind well validation uh, technique. Uh, we find the DFNN uh, validates uh, better on the percentage-based uh, validation because then I don't have to retrain the network again. Uh, what is percentage-based validation? Uh, in this validation, uh, I divide the original data set into two subsets. Uh, so let's say I have 30% of points that I'm validating on and 70% of points that I am training on. Uh, so this selection of points into validation set or training set is a random uh, selection. And the DFNN is retrained on the reduced training uh, data and then uh, it's applied to the hidden data sets. Uh, with deep feed forward neural network, um, the advantage is that it uh, offers a good parameter control. Um, some speakers talked about it, but um, there is a great variety of parameters they did not mention. The first um, important parameter, of course, is the number of hidden layers. The second uh, important parameter is how many nodes I actually have in each hidden layer. Um, let's say if I am starting with 30 attributes, uh, how many attributes will I use in the hidden layer, whether it will be one third, two thirds, or all 30 attributes. Um, then there is a minimization option. That's the algorithm that uh, solves for, uh, for the weights, whether it's gradient descent or um, uh, other, other techniques. And, and there are other, uh, uh, other parameters that we can uh, play with. Uh, let's look specifically into uh, these three ones. Number of hidden layers, number of nodes in a hidden layer, and total number of iterations that contribute towards convergence of the neural network. Um, so as the number of hidden layers is increased, um, we model the network more accurately. Hence, increasing the number of, uh, of uh, layers will potentially uh, improve my training error, but then the validation error will drop out. 
So it depends how many wells you are feeding as an input. Uh, in the case of the Blackfoot prediction, I had only 12 wells as an input. And that's why in that case it was worthwhile only to use three layers in the prediction. And we found that our network was converging already well enough. We tested the number of iterations. So the red curve is the validation curve, the black curve is the training curve. And we found that the network was converging after 10 iterations already. So there was no need to overtrain. And we also noticed that adding more nodes uh, in a hidden layer was not improving the training results. And two algorithms were tried, uh, conjugate gradient and steepest descent. Um, but then lastly, we investigated two approaches. What happens if we are lacking well data? So in this case, we generated synthetic data. And we generated the synthetic data using uh, two methods. Uh, the first one was systematic changes, and the second one using rock physics models. I have about three minutes left. So in systematic changes, I, modeled, uh, I modified my porosity gradation. Uh, I changed my porosity from 1 to 28%, and I also changed my gas saturation in the wells from 0 to 100%, and I created 24 extra wells, and then trained on those additional wells in order to improve DFNN. So I added more uh, synthetic data to my real data. And what I found, for example, in this case of density prediction, the top part shows density from pre-stack inversion, the bottom part shows density from DFNN, so that my density prediction with those pseudo wells was improved. Another approach that I looked into is using rock physics modeling, a similar technique that was um, described before. And essentially, I uh, fit one or more rock physics models to the well data, created additional logs, calibrated those logs. Here I was computing V-shell volumetric logs, and then enhanced uh, a broader uh, porosity spectrum. Uh, so uh, my original porosity data set was um, around 22% of porosity with a mean value of 5%. And my new data set had up to 34% of porosities with a mean value of 11%. So when I predicted uh, my reservoir using this extra training data set, this was the original prediction using real data, and this was the improved prediction um, using this uh, synthetic data and DFNN. Uh, notice the narrower dynamic range in predicted porosity, lower correlation values, and uh, higher errors. And these are some values uh, af after adding pseudo wells. So in summary, here I introduced the feed-forward neural networks showed how to validate, how to use the parameter testing, uh, in what cases it's beneficial to add extra pseudo-wells. Um, and uh, we added those two specific approaches for adding synthetic data. I would like to thank uh, Dan Hampson uh, and John Downton of CGG for their work on the Feed Forward Neural Network, and also RKBP, uh, Avon uh, Chesnes, for his uh, work uh, with CGG Hampson Russell. Uh, we submitted a paper for EAGE's first uh, workshop on machine learning, uh, where we applied this Deep Feed Forward Neural Network algorithm. Um, so just uh, before I finish and move on to the questions, I would like to finish on this quote. It takes a knowledge to know that a tomato is a fruit, but it takes wisdom not to put tomato in a fruit salad. So when you are applying machine learning techniques to your data, please make your fruit salad wisely. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I saw that you 
put in attributes uh, that you compute into the deep neural network. Typically in deep learning, the approach is that you let the network figure out the features uh, based on the data and the task. Um, which attributes did you find actually improved then the prediction, or what attributes do you put into the network? And just stop. Uh, selecting uh, good attributes is very important for neural networks. When we did our work with RKBP, we played with a variety of attributes, and what we find is that it was very important for us to be able to interpret the attributes and select only those attributes that had some geophysical meaning to us, uh, then we would be able to link our neural networks back to the original geology instead of blindly feeding all the attributes that I had and then just treating neural network as a black box. That's why we run multilinear regression on a variety of scenarios. We classified and ranked our attributes and we found the best attributes, the best two attributes, the best three attributes, and then we fed uh, only those best attributes to the deep feed forward neural network. Another approach for deep feed forward neural networks is to use principal component analysis and then minimize your, reduce your attribute space and use only meaningful attributes to the network instead of feeding all the data and pred predicting anything. 